We are almost halfway into our convention, and this morning we are going to have a feature talk by Bishop Luis Antonio Tagle, the Bishop of Imus in the Philippines. I told the, those who were in the Vocation Congress yesterday afternoon that when Thailand was chosen to be the host for the Sarah International Convention, it was about four or five years ago. And at that time, the International Convention Committee said that, or suggested that, when we come all the way from the West, from North America, from Latin America, from Europe, to Asia, we should have a resource person from Asia as well. And the first name that came to my mind, and the only name that came to my mind at that time, was Bishop Takle. I think, like some of you, or many of you, we normally have several appointments at the same time, at several places, from time to time. When that happened to me, on any occasion, say for instance this morning, the Deputy Prime Minister came to my school. He is still in my school at the moment. And we may also have some other appointments. But if one of those appointments is to listen to the talk of Bishop Takle, it's only Bishop Takle <laughs> for me. He is the most sought after speaker and the most liked uh, uh, speaker in Asia. Whenever the Federation of Asian Bishop Conferences have the meeting, they always make sure that Bishop Takle will be one of the speakers. And so, when we meet in Bangkok this year, we have the theme of Be Not Afraid, rising to the vocations challenge of the 21st century. We have invited Bishop Takle to please come and share his thought on this theme, especially the challenge, the vocations challenge of this century. What should we discern about and so for the next 45 minutes or so, let us concentrate on what he will or he may give us some homework for further discernment, for further practical suggestions on this theme. Please join me to welcome Bishop Takle, Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Il Presidente, <laughs> Mr. China Rome. Thank you. I told him that sounded like a canonization uh, <laughs> decree rather than an introduction to, a, to an address. Uh, I would like to greet all of you once again, your eminence and uh, the bishops, the priests, the religious, and the wonderful uh, lay people in our midst. Buongiorno, buenos dias, bonjour, what else? Magandang umaga, you know, and so on. Sawadi. <laughs> it is really a great honor for me to be part of this 63rd Sarah International Convention. And I would like to thank all of you for coming to Asia. Asia, which according to Pope John Paul II in Ecclesia in Asia, Asia where the vocation of our fathers and mothers in faith began, 
Asia where Jesus Christ was born. Asia where the church originated and from where it spread to the rest of the world. During the special assembly of the Synod of Bishops for Asia, Pope John Paul II stood up, looked at the bishops of Asia directly and said, I am reminding you, Jesus was born on Asian soil. You are where Jesus was born. I'm sorry to say that, I'm very sorry uh, to the Irish among you. You know, Jesus is not Irish after all. Jesus is Asian. <laughs> My task this morning is simple and humble. I will not pretend to be able to give you the final word on how to rise to the vocation's challenge of the 21st century. I am not capable of that. My paper or my presentation is a modest contribution to the ongoing reflection on this important and urgent matter. Every moment in the history of humanity actually poses, presents specific challenges to vocation. Our century, the 21st century, is not the first and only century that will present challenges to vocations. Even from the apostolic times, even from the time of Abraham, <laughs> even from the time of Adam and Eve. And if we look at the history of the church, we can conclude that the world in which men and women live, the world which they construct, has always been the context for the flourishing or the decline of vocations. And so as previous generations of Christians grappled with the vocation's challenge of their particular times, we of the 21st century are urged by our faith to do the same. We should really discern and confront the vocation's challenges peculiar to the 21st century. Now, to facilitate our reflection, I will offer, first of all, a working description of vocation, the word vocation. Now, what I will present is not a strict definition, and it is not also a comprehensive description of what vocation is. What I will give is simply an aid, a help, to achieving a common understanding of vocation for the purposes of this conference. Uh, I, I thought I would start that way because we might be talking about vocation and if there are 200 persons here, 200 understandings of vocation might be operating. So at least for the purpose of this conference, I would offer a working description of uh, vocation. I should say, first of all, that I believe that it is the whole church, the whole community of believers and disciples of Jesus Christ that has a calling or vocation. It is the whole church that has a calling. It is important to associate the word vocation with the whole church, with the whole community. And it is within that community that every member discerns her or his particular calling. Mm -hmm. Are you still with me? <laughs> now, I also believe, as all of you believe with me, that vocation is a process. That's why I had a professor who said that we should not say 
I have a call. It's better to say I have a calling. It is a progressive thing. It's an ongoing thing. A vocation is a process which involves the total person. And because it is a dynamic reality, a vocation can grow or weaken. It can develop or it can regress. Vocation is tied to how a community or a person lives in their times. Vocation or calling is always a dynamic thing associated with how we live our faith. Now, having presented those as my presuppositions, let me now go to my working description of a vocation. For me, a vocation rests, as it were, on a tripod. Something like that. You know, what, uh, what the camera person is using, the tripod. There are three poles that, uh, where a vocation rests. First, someone who calls. Second, someone who is called. And third, a purpose for the calling. Without any of those three, then we don't have what we call a vocation. Someone who calls, someone who is called, and the purpose for the calling. If those are the three poles, then I can say a vocation is essentially a relationship between a caller and a called. A person who calls and a person who is called. But beyond being a mere relationship between someone who calls and someone who is called, a vocation is always directed to a purpose, directed to a mission. A calling is always a calling for or towards something or someone. A calling is always a calling towards something or someone. In other words, if I may use church language, a vocation is a relationship of communion for mission. There is a relational aspect, but that relational aspect is for ascending, a purpose, communion and mission. Let me try it again. This is actually an exam. You know, and the, uh, the video is, uh, will, uh, will uh, catch you if you do not uh, answer properly. What is the first poll? Someone who calls. Second poll? Who is called. And the third? The purpose for the calling. Wow. I can treat you to lunch. <laughs> But I am flying back to the Philippines after my talk. <laughs> so we can have lunch in Manila. <laughs> now let me now go to the, the three poles. The first pole of a vocation is someone who calls. In our Christian understanding, that someone is someone special. God. That someone who calls is God. Every calling begins with the divine initiative. It is God who begins a vocation. It is God who calls through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we say divine initiative, that means God was free and is free to call. And the freedom of the triune God, the Trinity, in calling emphasizes the character of a vocation as a gift. It is grace. A calling is unmerited grace. We do not deserve such love from God. But it is a manifestation of the freedom with which God acts. A vocation is an act 
fully an act of graciousness on the part of God who calls all of us to divine communion by following the Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. I think it is obvious that this first component of a vocation is perceived only in faith. If I say, I hear God calling me, that is a hearing in faith. I cannot say, God calls me unless it is by faith. So it is only by faith that someone can claim that God is calling him or her. Vocation, therefore, is essentially a faith reality. It is a faith reality. It is an experience in faith of a personal God who calls. Without faith, no one can discern a calling from God. It is faith in God. In a, in a faith, it is faith in a God who chooses and calls that is a prerequisite for my appreciation of any vocation. God who calls, but this is perceived in faith. Okay. Faith, however, is sown, nurtured, and fulfilled within a faith community. And that faith community is called the church. The church is fundamentally a community born out of faith. The, faith, the, the church is the coming together, the ecclesia, the gathering of those who believe in Jesus as the one sent by the Father. What makes us church is our faith, our common faith. And the faith transmitted by the church as its very life from generation to generation is the necessary condition for us to hear God's calling. You know, my presentation is quite dense. I am packing in one paragraph what I teach in two semesters. <laughs> so uh, you have to bear with me. <laughs> so it is within the church, a community that believes in a God who calls. It is there that individual believers can affirm their personal callings. So vocation, let me summarize this first point. Vocation is a reality determined by faith and by a community of faith. It is determined by faith and by a community of faith. My question is this. Can you imagine what will happen to vocation if faith withers? And when the church loses its dynamism, when there is no more faith, will there be vocation? When the church is not anymore a living community of faith, will there be vocations? Just asking. That first poll is rather disturbing. Now we go to the second poll. The second poll of a vocation is someone who is called. And hopefully, someone who hears the call and also responds to the call. A vocation will not bloom if there is only the first poll. Someone calling. May I know how many of you here are married? Please raise your hands. Los casados. 
<laughs> okay. Now, uh, you're married. I think it is a common experience. You call and call your spouse, but then nobody hears. <laughs> and nobody responds. And when you turn to face him or her, he or she has gone. <laughs> it's a common experience. Bishops experience that with their priests too. <laughs> And I'm sure the priest will say, we experience that of our bishops too. <laughs> now, so this is important. It is not enough to focus on the one who calls. We should also consider the one who is called and hopefully who hears and responds to the call. From our description, the hearers of the call are both the community and the individual believers. It is not just individuals, but the whole community. But why can they hear? They hear because they believe in an ongoing relationship with God. We cannot hear if there is no faith. But hearing in faith, huh? hearing in faith does not happen in, in, on some ethereal level of existence. Our common life and our individual capacity to listen in faith is affected by the historical, social, political, economic, and cultural factors that form our communities and form us as individual persons. We are acutely aware in our 21st century of the impact of social realities on people's faith, beliefs, questions, and commitments. If it is in con concrete communities and concrete men and women who are called then they are called and respond within the concrete realities of their historical existence. God calls men and women and communities in their times. Now let me tell you a short story. I was invited to be a facilitator in a renewal program for priests. And one of them raised his hand and said, I refuse to be part of this renewal. I said, why? He said, I prefer to be a priest of the 17th century rather than of the 20th century. I mean, sir, when were you called? <laughs> and when did you respond to the call? In the 17th century? I mean, sir, if the calling is concrete, the calling will come to you in your time, in your place of the world, in your life. And you should hear in your world, in your life. So, Thank you. <laughs> Vocation, therefore, is also determined, also determined by the realities of the hearer's world. I am a teacher, and the one thing that I discovered, you know, children who do not have three good meals a day are not able to listen and understand very well. The situation of poverty affects people's not only mental processes, but their capacity to respond. And if that is true of the learning process, it is also true 
of our capacity to hear and to respond to God's calling in faith. Now, my question. Can you imagine what type of hearers to God's calling the 21st century produces? Does the 20th century produce hearers or just noise makers? You know, I've been teaching the past 28 years. I started teaching at the age of 19. And I still look 29. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of vanity here. <laughs> but you know, in those 28 years, I have not been as frightened as I am now in facing students. 20 years ago, I could make my students listen to a three-hour lecture on Aristotle, Aquinas, and you can make them read. Now, after 10 minutes, you lose them. This is part of the computer world. You delete, delete, delete. And so you can delete your teacher. <laughs> and I can see in the eyes of the students and the hearers the way I can see in you right now whether the cursor is already pointed at me and you are ready to delete me. <laughs> I know that. That's why I'm so afraid to teach now. You cannot sustain hearing and listening. In the Philippines, they say the attention span of our contemporary students is 10 minutes. That's the most. Now, this is the type of people our contemporary computer technological world has produced. Hearers good only for 10 minutes. Now, what do you say when a calling is about forever? When our capacity is only 10 minutes? Just asking. I'm just asking. The third poll. The third poll of a vocation, as we said, is a purpose for the calling. And this is what we call in the church mission. A calling is always for mission. There is no calling that does not bring with it a particular mission. The calling of God sets a purpose for us to accomplish. In some sense, in some real sense, a vocation is making God's purpose for us my purpose in life. The process of clarifying vocation is actually the process of finding one's purpose in life as it is made known to us in faith. True mission happens when we align, align our life with God's purpose for humanity, for the church, and for ourselves. So when God calls, God sets a person's direction in life, towards the accomplishment of God's plan for the world. So vocation is actually a search for my purpose in life. It is a search for the mission that God offers to me for my life. Can you imagine what happens to vocation when people do not have a sense of 
purpose or mission in life? I don't know whether this is happening in, in your respective countries, but among the youth in the Philippines, the favorite word is whatever. <laughs> you ask them, what do you want to eat for lunch? Whatever. <laughs> what do you want to become after high school? Whatever. <laughs> Where do you want to go this afternoon? Wherever. Who is your boyfriend now? Whoever. <laughs> I mean, what will happen to vocations as purpose and mission in life when the present generation is a generation that does not care about purpose? Whatever is the best answer that I can give. I am just asking. Oh. Because I ask the questions, I am now given the difficult, the difficult task to at least start answering them. <laughs> I believe that the three poles of vocation and the three fundamental questions with which I ended the presentation of each portion, pose the very challenges to vocations in the 21st century. They may not be complete, but I think they pose the fundamental challenges to vocations in the 21st century. So let me frame the questions this way of the challenges. First, what are the contemporary challenges to faith in God and the reality of being church? I think that is the first question. Faith in contemporary times and being church. The second challenge, what are the challenges to hearing God's calling? And third, what are the challenges to developing a sense of purpose or mission in life? These are, these are, there are many more challenges, but I believe these are some of the crucial challenges. So now we go to these three poles as challenges. First, what is the contemporary challenge to faith in God and to the church as a community of faith? I think we do not need to be professional social scientists to see that the prevailing worldview in our 21st century is a technological, scientific, and pragmatic, functional worldview. You don't look at the flowers anymore and just behold the flowers as themselves. When we look at the flowers, we say, I wonder what medicinal value this has. It's all pragmatic, technological. Of course, it has provided a lot of benefits to human life. But just like any worldview, that technological, pragmatic worldview prevalent in the 21st century is insufficient. We are beginning to sense the loss of the sense of grace, gift, mystery, the sense of the sacred. And because of that, human success, human achievements have made us less dependent on God and has, have made us less see in faith the workings of God. In fact, many scientists are now creating human beings, not anymore in the image of God, but according to their image. They are fabricating now human beings.
Yet in the midst of all these human achievements, we observe a growing meaninglessness with accompanying anxiety, emptiness, and boredom. People don't seem to be settled in spite of achievements. The plurality that marks our society has also made beliefs and convictions a matter of public opinion. Everything is dictated by surveys rather than conviction or belief. And so, lasting commitment to beliefs is not anymore a value. When public opinion changes, then many people throw out their beliefs also, out the window. This mentality is nurtured by mass media and the world of business. The products become obsolete very quickly. Even stability in family life is threatened by the growing incidence of separation of couples, absentee parents, and displacement of peoples. In other words, we find developments in contemporary culture that challenge our need for God, our need for absolute truths, and for stable commitments, all traditionally considered necessary elements of faith and vocation. But aside from these cultural challenges to faith, <laughs> the present status of the church also poses a tremendous challenge to vocation. Many people, Christian believers included, they think that the church is not necessary for a meaningful human existence. The teachings and the values of the church are openly contradicted. And the scandals that have been plaguing the church have weakened the morale and faith commitment of some members. I gave a retreat to the clergy of a diocese somewhere in the United States. I won't mention the name of the diocese. But at the end of the retreat, one priest announced to his fellow priests, please pray for me. I want to leave the priesthood. Because I don't want to be associated with a church that is accused of such acts, criminal acts, towards children. Painful to hear. Painful to hear. In other words, can a church losing its influence and credibility be fertile ground for vocations? This is a challenge of the 21st century. A, a century of human success. But do we need faith? A century of a church plagued by scandals. Can it generate faith, and vocations. Let us turn to the second challenge, namely the capacity to hear and respond to God's calling. Hearing is not enough. It is listening that matters. Some people hear, but they do not listen. Listening. But listening involves attentiveness to and focus on the one speaking. Listening is a matter of paying attention, of losing myself, and being focused on the one before me. But when we look at the events in our respective countries and in the whole world, it seems we have a global crisis 
in listening. Our leaders do not know how to listen to one another. The advance in social communication has produced faster means of exchanging information, but not necessarily deeper listening and understanding. With cell phones, emails, internet facilities, with all of these things, our leaders still do not communicate with one another. They just cannot listen to one another. And by the way, the husbands and wives, the couples who are here, you know, once I was invited to San Francisco to address the gathering there on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the arrival of the first Filipino Catholics in San Francisco. And when our flight landed in San Francisco, the person next to me, a man, took out his cell phone and started calling the Philippines. You know, I was not eavesdropping, you know, but I was so close I could hear. You know? <laughs> this was all uh, uh, unintentional. You know? And then he asked the question, what time is it now in the Philippines? You know, I was so touched. I said, look at this man, barely a minute on American soil, and his thoughts were already flying back to, the, to his home. And he said, where is my wife? Oh, I said, oh, I wonder with whom he was talking, probably the helper in the house. And then he said, if my wife looks for me, tell her I'm playing golf in Manila. Imagine. He was in San Francisco and he wants his wife to know that he was just playing golf in Manila. Now that gadget called cell phone is now being used as a tool for cheating. With the cell phone, you really do not know where the person is, unlike the landline. I ask you, those who are married, where are your husbands now? <laughs> where are your wives now? <laughs> and the bishops, where are your priests now? <laughs> and the superiors of religious communities, where are your community members now? So what I do, I call priests through the cell phone. I said, oh, Father, where are you? And then I said, I'm in the rectory. Oh, good. And then I call the landline. So may I speak with Father? He's not here. Aha! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no. You know, we have a lot of means to communicate, but we are using the means not to communicate. We are hiding from one another. Listening is not a virtue anymore. And as I said, even teachers observe that the attention span of children is getting shorter. Now this phenomenon of the lack of capacity to hear and to listen comes as no surprise when we factor in individualism and competition in the world when we lose sensitivity and accountability and respect and communion, we also lose the ability to listen. Why will you listen to your competitor? Why will you listen to an enemy? But many of us will say, oh, but we listen a lot. We listen to a lot of music. We, wa we watch talk shows. We watch movies, etc. Oh yes, we do. While watching movies, we are listening to the radio. That's what our young people are doing. As they are reading their books, they're watching TV and listening to their Walkman. Multiple listening skills. 
And as we subject ourselves to an overdose of sounds and images, we really lose our capacity to stop, look, and listen. Sometimes I ask, are these ways of escaping from reality? I ask this because I observe, even among my students, that reflection, internalization, and discernment are not so appreciated now as before. Discernment, internalization, uh, reflection take too much precious time. It will lessen my time for work, devoted to work and recreation. We want instant actions, instant results. And listening hmm, is a rather long path to take. And so, it is the road less traveled by. And so, one challenge of the 21st century, known for sophisticated means of communication, but not necessarily translated into deep communication and listening, uh, the challenge is how can we discern vocation when nobody listens. And the final challenge is the sense of purpose or mission in life. Many scholars and commentators say that the 21st century is characterized by a lack of compelling vision, focus, direction, and investment in dreams. How I wish there would be more Martin Luther Kings who could stand and say, I have a dream. Boredom, tiredness, indifference, que sera sera. These things sap our energy. The energy which is better spent for a purposeful life, we spend it elsewhere. And given the plurality of choices in life, people are constantly choosing but not committing. Those of my generation will probably remember Georgie Girl. Always window shopping, but never stopping to buy. Window shopping endlessly, but not committing. Well, this comes, comes with a phenomenon called multiplicity of selves. Each person now has multiple identities and multiple selves. Before your wife, you are one person. Before your children, you're another person. Before your secretary, you're another person. Before the local parish priest, you're another person. That is the expertise of the 21st century. Multiple selves. And then the true self is buried undetected for a long time. So the challenge is, how can vocation for mission grow in people who have a weak sense of identity and direction in life? Mm -hmm. There are more things to say. Now, that is a rather heavy and grim presentation of the challenges but I purposely did it that way so that we can wonder whether vocations still make sense in the 20th, 21st century. Is there a place for vocations in our contemporary world? Is there a future for vocations in the 21st century with those challenges to faith, church, listening and hearing? 
and sense of purpose in life, the challenges seem to cut vocation from the very roots. Is the 21st century still a century for vocations? Well, the answer is not mine to give, <laughs> but for Jesus to give. He says, be not afraid. Be not afraid. We rise to the vocation's challenge by trusting in Jesus, whom the Father called and who in turn called disciples to follow him and share his mission. Jesus met challenges in responding to his own mission, to his own vocation. He ended on the cross. His mission and vocation were challenged severely. He faced tremendous odds in forming his first chosen followers. Oh, it must have been difficult for Jesus to nurture the vocation of a Peter, of an Andrew, of a Magdalene, of a Judas. But he knew what he was saying when he uttered many times in the Gospels, be not afraid. We need to trust and have faith in the one who calls. Trust in Jesus demands, however, learning from him and learning from the valuable lessons of history on how to equip the church and its members to listen and to respond to God's calling for mission in the 21st century. I believe, I firmly believe that we should avoid giving the impression that the 21st century is a God forsaken moment in time, unvisited by God and not bearing fruit of vocation. We should not look at the world and its challenges from pure negativity and pessimism. Maybe the church should listen more to the Holy Spirit. The challenges that I have indicated posed by the world could be the very voice of Jesus calling forth new spiritual energies from us. The challenges are not meant to dampen our energies. The challenges are there for us to rise to the challenge. For all we know, grace might be trapped in those challenges, just waiting to be unleashed, unpacked. But we have to follow the way of Jesus. Jesus unpacked grace in a great challenge called Peter. If I were Jesus, I would not know how to handle Peter. Probably in the washing of the feet, I would have cut off the feet of Peter <laughs> rather than wash his feet. But Jesus saw Peter as a challenge and saw the grace in the challenge. And he became the chief shepherd. I end with a few suggestions. First, it is not true, it is not true that the present generation is not capable of believing, not capable of faith. It probably manifests its faith differently from other generations. But contemporary people, Christians most especially, are also in desperate need of role models in faith. That is what our age needs. 
role models in faith. Faith in the contemporary times is enlivened and evoked on the human level by the joy, humility, and service of people who have responded to their own calling. If the married people do not show joy in marriage, there will be more live-in situations. If the religious turn out to be, as I used the term yesterday, cranky old bachelors and maidens, young people would not waste their precious lives joining religious communities. If priests spend more time recreating, recreating themselves rather than being vessels or instruments of the recreation, the creation anew of the people, then people will just say, why join them? I can recreate by myself. The seeming, seeming disinterest in faith in our time might be a prophetic call from the Holy Spirit inviting us to authenticity in faith. Authenticity. At a time when public servants in all spheres of life, government, military, financial institutions are not trusted because of lack of integrity, it is not surprising that people do not know whom to believe. Let us restore faith through our joyful fidelity to our own vocations. Second, let us try our best to make our church a true community whose faith is its life and whose life is its faith. The scandals in the church could even be turned to its advantage if they will produce a more humble, truthful, just, and prayerful church. The church can be a better ground for vocations if it engages the hopes and joys, anxieties and sorrows of our time, if we make those sorrows and hopes our own and share the best gift we could offer, namely the gospel of Jesus. If we as church go back to the gospel and live by the gospel, then we will be healed and people will believe again. Third, it is not totally true that our contemporaries are incapable of hearing God's calling. They search for the voice of God in many ways, sometimes in disconcerting modes of irreverence. You know, let me interrupt this with a short story. You know, I was in confirmations, I, and there was a young girl who approached me, and she stood on one foot with her ha arms crossed in front of the bishop. <laughs> I was waiting for her to straighten up, but there were hundreds of them lined up, and I said, oh, I better just anoint her. I said, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And she kept looking at me. I said, say Amen. But instead of saying amen, she just shrugged her shoulders. And the two sponsors, the witnesses, shook her. Said, Say amen. Say amen. And she did the same thing. Just shrugged her shoulders. And one of the sponsors dragged her back to her seat. And really, I was oh, fuming with anger, you know, with the irreverence. And at that point, I prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, in your eternal plan, I would become a bishop someday. Why did you not make me a bishop before Vatican II when confirmation still included that spanking? <laughs> I would have confirmed her three times. 
Now it is a modest anointing. I could not have done anything. <laughs> Why only now? Well, of course, I was born much later. So I could not have been <laughs> a bishop before that. But, but really, but you know, when I started reflecting on that incident that same evening, I realized it was around that time when the newspapers in the Philippines carried a lot of news regarding scandals of priests and bishops. Probably, it was the girl's way of saying, are you authentic? Are you like them? Maybe through irreverence, our young people are searching and trying to locate where God is present. So when people come, when we come to people and when people come to us, especially the youth, let us not come to them with labels or prejudgments, but with a focus on the good they possess. And they have tremendous good. Let us appreciate the limits they struggle with, the pressure, the tremendous pressures that they bear, and the confusion that they face. And when we do that, our compassion will prepare them to hear the voice of the Lord. It is compassionate hearers who will enable others to hear the word of God. And finally, it is not true that our contemporaries in the 21st century do not have a sense of purpose in life. They are definitely searching for life itself. It may take them longer compared to uh, previous generations, but it doesn't matter for as long as they search. But we have to be attentive to the different ways by which they express their search for purpose. Giving them opportunities to have personal contact with the suffering, with the poor, and the victims of history can awaken a sense of purpose. We also have to give them room to express their life's purpose with creativity and uniqueness. The Holy Spirit might still surprise us with the unexpected ways by which people of the 21st century would plunge into mission. We should not think that our contemporaries are not capable of mission. We are called to rise to the vocations challenge of the 21st century. As God called people of centuries of old to share his life and mission, so God calls people of the 21st century as they are, as we are. God calls them to participate in the divine purpose, not in another time and world, but in the 21st century. We rise to the challenge of vocations by understanding and embracing the 21st century. By listening to God's calling within the grandeur and the brokenness of the 21st century. Let us remember, Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, John, Mary of Magdala, Augustine of Hippo, Ignatius of Loyola, Teresa of Calcutta, Lorenzo of Manila, and many others as people graced and broken in their own times and within their times. We do not despair, therefore. In our brokenness, God continues to call. God is still here. And God still says, be not afraid. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thing. Make sure that in the future, when you see the name Bishop Takle as a speaker anywhere in the world, be there before the time. Make sure you get a good seat. Bishop, I, I believe I can speak for all of us that we really appreciate your talk. We really like your talk and it is truly after the magnificent presentation of His Eminence Cardinal Grokolevsky yesterday, your talk today really make the whole convention of us so complete. Thanks for your suggestion, thanks for your sharing. He will have to go to the airport. He is wanted in the Philippines <laughs> for another talk. Um, I'm afraid that we may not have time, but you may try to catch him uh, outside. You like to say a word? I just wanted to tell you, we listen to you. Come to the microphone, please. Just, I think we can entertain one comment. I want to tell you that we listen today. Thank you. Very good. I thought that you were going to ask, what is the secret of him to, to be being forever young? <laughs> um, we have CDs available and we try to sell it as cheaply as possible at cost price, $5. You order today, you get it tomorrow. You order tomorrow, you get on the following day. But if you order less than 24 hours before the convention ends, we have to add, I don't know, another $10, $15 for shipping. So order today and get it tomorrow. And now, join the Thai Saran celebrating the 25th uh, anniversary of our Bing Sura in Thailand, their lunch. And so now, the, the food, the spiritual food is over. We now will have the physical uh, food on the other room. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.